Well, for more, we're joined by François Isbourg, Senior Advisor at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Before we dive into the day's news, did you think that in 2022 we'd be back to this kind of war? This specific war, maybe not, but this kind of war, that is the return of a large-scale war between two sovereign states uh, equipped with com relatively modern armies. Uh, yes, uh, that was very much uh, on the cards uh, in recent years, uh, which is indeed one of the reasons I wrote my recent book, which, uh, which came out last year, about the return of war uh, in Europe, of course, uh, not not simply war. But we haven't we have seen, seen this. It. I mean, we haven't seen this. What a sovereign state invading another. We had a civil war, obviously, in the former Yugoslavia. We had, uh, yes, we had. No, we 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 we've had. Maybe if you count Cyprus in 1974. No, no, we we have had precursor wars like the one between Russia and Georgia in 2008, uh, or the what I'd call the regional war between. Russia and Ukraine in Crimea and subsequently in the Donbass. Uh, uh, so there were, uh, there were a number of uh, warning signals. And on top of that, of course, we have seen uh, technological change uh, uh, with uh, here also a number of precursors. That is the way in which uh, uh, modern combat using uh, integrated uh, intelligence and combat capabilities and, uh, of course, heavy reliance on drones, combat drones, uh, notably by Turkey in the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, which was pretty close to what I would call a conventional war, uh, old-style war, uh, or indeed uh, the, f the fight between uh, uh, the Turkish forces and the Wagner mercenaries in Libya uh, two years ago, in which the uh, uh, the Turks uh, gave a very rough ride uh, to the to to the Russians. Uh, that, that, that's an important point. Are, are we talking here about a conventional war as such, or how much of an element of asymmetrical warfare do we have with the use of drones, with the the fact that we know the Ukrainians have been uh, relying on. Well, it's only asymmetrical in the sense that some have been smarter than others in equipping themselves with modern uh, uh, means of, of war and being able to integrate them in their force structure. Uh, but there's nothing which on paper looks as similar to the Ukrainian army as the Russian army and vice versa, or between Azerbaijan and Armenia to take a, a, a slightly smaller previous war. Uh, both of them, by the way, being fought uh, between largely Soviet-era equipped uh, forces. Uh, but uh, so there, there's nothing asymmetric in the sense that we use that word to talk about uh, wars between uh, uh, nor uh, quote unquote normal armies and guerrilla forces uh, or between uh, uh, conventional forces and uh, terrorist op operations like Daesh uh, in the Middle East. Here we are, uh, we are no longer in uh, the era, uh, the post Cold War era, in which we had a lot of asymmetric uh, warfare. This is actually beyond symmetry, beyond it's, asymmetry. It's, it's beyond asymmetry. Did you think that two months in, Russia would not have complete air supremacy over Ukraine? No, I didn't. Uh, that, that was actually quite stunning because uh, it's not that the calculus about what would happen on the Ukrainian side uh, uh, was wrong uh, because the Ukrainian Air Force uh, was on paper quite inferior to in numbers uh, uh, to the Russian Air Force. What well, was really surprising is that the Russian Air Force gave such a poor account uh, of itself uh, and that many of its uh, uh, very modern capabilities uh, uh, were confined to an extremely narrow proportion uh, of its uh, uh, of its forces. Uh, and uh, yes, this came as a surprise. So in Kyiv, you're coming back from Kyiv rather, the U.S. Defense Secretary says with the right equipment and the right support, Ukraine can win the war. Is that well, PSYOPs, or is that real? Is he stating fact, Lloyd Austin? Well, there, there are two levels of analysis here. One is that uh, I, Lloyd Austin, is, is, he's a very good man. I mean, I, I've known him for some years. Uh, uh, but 
since what he said is actually probably true, he shouldn't have said it. Uh, so at the political level, I think it was actually a mistake for him to have expressed himself in so many words, uh, because he is taunting. He is taunting the Russians. Whether it's clever to taunt the Russians is an arguable proposition. Uh, then at another level, uh, you know, some say it's the only thing the Russians understand is force. Oh, that you have to. Oh, of course. That that's precisely why you have. You know, remember the Theodore Roosevelt formula: as uh, speak softly and use a big stick. Uh, sometimes our American friends speak very loudly and uh, don't necessarily wield a big stick. Um, uh, uh, so on what do we have in Ukraine? We have the, a Russian offensive, which began four or five days ago in the Donbass. It hasn't been going ter terribly well. It's maybe a tad early to say whether it's actually failed. We'll know that within a day or two now. I mean, a day or two? A day or two, yeah. The, the, it's been unfolding. And it, it was like the, the, the other offensive, which was very different in nature on the 24th of February. We knew within three days that this was going very badly wrong for the Russians. And, and three days more, we knew that they were really suffering. Uh, we are now at the stage where you know, unless something unexpected happens today or tomorrow, the Russians are not going to be in a fit state uh, to continue their offensive, which in effect means that with the right motivation, which they have, the Ukrainians, with the right kit, which they're receiving now in quite considerable numbers, and with a bit of cooperation from the weather, uh, 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 things can happen in the Donbass uh, which uh, could go up to and include uh, the liberation of parts of the Donbass, which had been uh, under Russian effective control, the so-called separatists, uh, since 2014. And then how does Vladimir Putin react, particularly as we, we, we read, for instance, the Financial Times uh, sources at the Kremlin saying that uh, he, he's not for peace talks right now. He, well, yeah, uh, he's, not in a, uh, he's not in a position to enter p peace talks. That's quite clear. So what happens he, if, he, if he does suffer setbacks and the Ukrainians push back beyond the, the, towards the, well? Th that is going to be a very significant issue. And uh, we don't want to make it more complicated by uh, getting into a gab fest. I mean, they are starting to, uh, uh, to taunt him verbally. That's actually the thing not to do. It's, that's more serious than actually moving his forces out of areas in which they shouldn't be. I think we can afford, we can run the risk of making him and his army very unhappy. Uh, but you don't want to add to the risk by shooting off your mouth. François Isbou, I don't know if you noticed, but there was an election here in France. Uh, uh, so they say. So, so they, they say. say. One of the messages of congratulations for the winner uh, coming from the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, saying, I sincerely wish you success in your state activities as well as good health and well-being. Our Brussels correspondent said at first reading, it looks a little like a threat, but then uh, he's take, they're taking it, he says, in Brussels at face value when he wishes Emmanuel Macron good health. Your thoughts? <laughs> the short answer is I don't know. Uh, uh, but it, but it, 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 it is surprisingly personal uh, to, to use that formulation. Maybe, maybe he's thinking about his own health. It's a, it's a possibility. Uh, Macron, who, uh, in pushing his pro-EU agenda, is talking about another stimulus plan. There's the idea that's being floated in Paris of uh, spending money to beef up defense, spending money to develop liquefied natural gas terminals so they're not reliant uh, on Russian gas. What will Macron too be like when it comes to Ukraine and Russia and the EU on that yeah, score? Yeah, two stages. First stage, which is the urgent stage, is to have some sort of mutual understanding between France and Germany on weapons to Ukraine. 
Uh, that's an enormously confused issue in Germany. It's very difficult to understand what is going on in the coalition, but it would make a lot of sense uh, to have. Or the French are communicating less than the Americans. You talked about the Americans. Indeed, before. but the French, uh, you know, three days ago, four days ago, Macron came out into the open, tore, tore apart part of the veil of secrecy uh, when he said that we were uh, delivering to Ukraine uh, these so-called Caesar uh, howitzers, which are actually, so the experts say, amongst the best in the world. This is actually tremendously useful to the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians know it. And the Russians, of course, don't like it one single bit. But Macron went public on that, despite the electoral campaign. I mean, you, know, you don't normally win electoral campaigns uh, by engaging in warlike activity for a third party, which is what we're doing in favor of Ukraine, and rightly so. Uh, the, the other thing which is urgent is having some sort of agreement uh, uh, with the Germans on how to ratchet back as quickly as possible uh, their purchases of Russian oil and gas. And this is a huge problem created by Germany's uh, rather difficult to understand energy policy of the last 25 years. Uh, but it is what it is, and uh, it, it makes it very difficult uh, to uh, stop subsidizing uh, Putin's war effort, which is what these imports are, are, are doing. And that Germany should continue to do that is simply uh, runs against common sense and I think against uh, common morality. Uh, so there's going to have to be some sort of agreement in the month of May on how this particular uh, uh, beast will be uh, skinned. And, and we know that after he takes the oath of office for a second term, Emmanuel Macron's first trip will be to Berlin to see As usual. Uh, Olaf Scholz. François Eisbourg of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, many thanks for being with us here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.